Hi, everybody around the world. Uh, uh, my name is Jason Pearson, and uh, I'm a principal Android engineer at Hinge, uh, which is a dating app. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about, um, I titled my talk, How to Make an App. And I specifically uh, did this as, as like a lunch and learn inside of my company at one point, and it was meant to help everyone understand uh, what goes into making an app. And if someone was curious about learning editor development or mobile development in general, uh, whether that was React Native or Flutter or Kotlin multi-platform um, uh, or, or just native Android or iOS, uh, all of this could apply to you because this is uh, the concepts of how to make an app from start to finish and, and, and what can motivate and inspire you. So, um, with that, I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. So uh, first of all, what is an app? Um, it's application software, performs a specific task for an end user, and we refer to it apps uh, in common uh, language now. Uh, we can make an app for. Well, a lot of us make apps for phones because we're Android developers and we're at Android worldwide, but you can make apps for any kind of platform, laptops, desktops, printers, headphones, old TVs, new TVs, race cars, and satellites. Uh, pretty much anything that runs software, you could make an app for, uh, whether it's embedded systems or it has a UI. Um, so why do we do this? Um, now, it's usually because someone has an idea or um, they see something and maybe it's a problem or a, a different way of doing something and they think, huh, I think I can make something that solves that. Or they just wanna make money, which we all honestly do. Um, or they see someone hurt, um, maybe not physically, but maybe emotionally. Maybe they wanna make a meditation app that makes people feel better or, or helps them with uh, their mentality um, and approach to life. Um, maybe they want to use science and experiment, may or maybe they want to see um, uh, improve how people do experiments. Uh, then you have to start thinking about who are you making it for? Um, there's all kinds of different people in the world doing all kinds of different things, um, learning, teaching, and it's a very diverse set of people that makes up the entire world uh, doing all sorts of things. And they come from all different countries. Uh, so you have to keep in mind the audience that you're making this for is not just you, not just your friend necessarily, but once it's on the App Store, anyone can download this. Uh, what is the end result? So uh some people make uh guitar tab apps in order to learn how to play music some people like to make photo take uh, taking apps you might have heard of instagram uh, some people make games uh, there's a whole category of apps on both apple's app store and google play on games some people track coronavirus uh, or other diseases some people just make eye candy um, some people just make an alarm clock uh, and then there's how will they use it? And some people will interact it with your app by touch. Others will listen to music. Um, others might not, um, might be deaf. So maybe uh, they actually have to um, get other feedback uh, through vibration, uh, or maybe they're gonna use it as a fitness app. So they're not gonna look at it, touch at it, or do anything with it in the main interaction with your app, but they count on your app to keep working. And lastly, what is the user journey? Um, user journey is, uh, could be really hard, could be really rough and uh, an unknown path, or it could be really enjoyable. It could bring out a lot of uh, fun emotions, could bring out, uh, out love, like a dating app. Um, so these are the generally four things that I think about when, uh, I think of the question like, oh, I want to want to make an app. Like, what am I gonna? What motivates me to make this? What? Who am I building it for? 
the end result, like what, what the users get out of this and what the user journey is going to be like, how enjoyable um, is it going to be or not enjoyable. So with that, let's look at Android Studio for a second. Now, first time you boot, ever boot up Android Studio and you make a new project, you're going to see something like this where you see main activity and uh, what is an activity? It's a, it's a window into your app and it has this uh, very roughly this interface where you have these lifecycle methods on create, on start, on resume, on pause. This is an Android programmer's beginner intro into how to um, make their very first Android app. These are your entry points. This is like public static void main from any other programming language um, like Java or um, main function in Python. Uh, when you write in Android, you don't have a single main function from which your program is called. That is abstracted away from you. What you have is these lifecycle things that say, this is when your window or screen is created and present. So if we override on create, then we can write some code that actually uh, does something on the screen. And we can add a layout. And all of a sudden, if we ran this, we would have a white screen by default. And if you started looking into that layout, uh, and by default, you would have a constraint layout probably, because uh, this talk was written before I started write, writing stuff in Compose. Um, you would then add a text view and you'd be able to ha have hello world appear on your layout. Now, I wanna talk about what is on this screen and its components for a second, because it's really important to understand. Uh, there's the window, which is that like bluish area behind the uh, your layout. Then that white area, I already mentioned, that's, that's your activity um, and the layout on your activity. And that hello world is a text view on your screen. In order to move things around, uh, we typically use constraints these days. And what does that look like? Well, uh, usually, typically, constraints are on one of these four points. You can also uh, make a constraint on a baseline of text, but that's uh, out of scope for this talk. So if you were to click and drag on the layout editor in Android Studio, you'd be able to constrain it, this thing, to another thing. Uh, how does that work in practice? Well. If I can took the bottom constraint and connected it to the parent or the window, um, the its parent object, it would be constrained to the bottom. I could then do the same to the top. I could do it to the right and left sides. Uh, typically, we call these start and end because of left to right and right to left compatibility. And now I have something that's centered on the screen. If I wanted to offset it, by 100 dp, uh, I could add a 100 dp margin on one of my constraints in order to make that offset happen. I could then remove my bottom constraint and have it pinned to the top by 100 dp centered horizontally in the screen. As you can see, you could start building and constraining things together uh, to make what you see in applications on the Play Store. Uh, I want to talk a bit about layout and more complex uh, and, and like what considerations we make when we um, think about layouts. Um, typical user profile might look like this on a random map where you have someone's name, someone's age, where they are. But just because, uh, uh, um, just to relate back to like that constraints thing, this is how I would constrain this um, particular layout. I would constrain the name to the top, and I would constrain uh, the photo to uh, the horizontally to the parent. I would constrain the photo's top to the name, and I would constrain the age and location to uh, the bottom of the photo. And that's how everything would fit and be constrained within the screen. Um, that means that all kinds of different device sizes would then be able to reflexively adapt or uh, be responsive to however the screen gets sized. Um, and as you saw on this slide, um, the layout constraints did not really take in consideration 
this size screen and device. Um, it pushed everything off the bottom of the page and you can't even see uh, some important details that, or, or some details that might be considered important um, for this particular layout. So it's important to keep different device sizes and resolutions in mind. By the way, this is not a real device. This is totally fictional. I just stretched this phone uh, in all different ways. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is information hierarchy and one way to do that is by size. So your eyes are drawn right now to the name Clara and maybe the photo, and then kind of to age in Brooklyn. But if I completely changed sizes of these different things, uh, then your eyes would be drawn to different things, uh, depending on what is the biggest. Um, things gain and lose importance through size. Another way to do it is by contrast. Uh, there's things that are impossible to read. And you can look up um, WCAG standards, which is actually web standards. There aren't mobile standards for accessibility, but uh, hopefully there will be in the coming years because that's really hard to deal with. You can, you can look up those standards and look up a uh, contrast tool websites in order to understand what passes accessibility for contrast. Um, obviously, Pure black on pure white definitely passes that test, but what is the dividing line at different font sizes? Um, that's really important to understand. Uh, another thing is variance, just something different. Um, you're gonna read the thing that stands out before everything else, whether it's in the middle of something or um, completely off to the side or by color. Another thing is platform expectations. What you're seeing right now is material UI for buttons. And in order from top to bottom, what a user would reasonably expect a button to look like or a clickable thing to look like on Android. The top is the most button-esque thing. And then as we go towards the bottom, there is less and less of an expectation from a user standpoint that if they click on this thing, there is going to be some kind of action. Another thing to keep in mind is touch targets. Um, if you make a button too small, a user tries to hit it on the screen and they can't. So always keep them large enough so that um, someone with any size finger or hand or someone with uh, mobility disability uh, can use your screen as, as best, as easily as possible. Uh, and if we wanted to have this button actually do something, what we would do in our onCreate that I mentioned before is refer to the UI uh, button through view binding and set an onClick listener. And we'd write some code and it would do something like maybe show some text on the screen and say something happened. Another point to keep in mind in Android development and mobile development in general is configuration changes. If you were to rotate this phone uh, and uh, that, that is one type of configuration change that you might have to handle and have the screen reorient or UI reorient unless you maybe tried to pin the UI. But another thing that uh, a user can do that you cannot prevent necessarily is if they tap on an edit text, um, having the keyboard appear. That is going to change your window size. Um, you, you cannot uh, restrict that. Uh, and you have to anticipate um, possibly tens of thousands of devices in the train sizes. Or the thing is uh, scrolling in a list. You have to think about how information is going to move and that the user realizes that your screen is scrollable because sometimes when they look at a app, this is not apparent. Um, even though you built it and you know that this is scrollable, it might not be visually apparent to a user. And if that's all they're doing is looking at it, um, how are they going to know? So one way is having making sure that elements are going to get cut off at the bottom of the screen. Another thing is to try to give a visual animation bouncing indicator at the bottom for the very first time they've ever used your app to say, hey, this is scrollable, and you should give it a try. Uh, another thing is flinging, um, and this is 
probably <laughs> laughably common that we don't think about this anymore. But when mobile devices were introduced, this was a completely new UI pattern. Like we didn't have touch screens in commonplace before mm, 14 years ago, or not, not ones that weren't crazy expensive. So uh, this is a UI pattern that uh, when you get into app development, you have to understand uh, does the user need to be able to fling very quickly through your list of things? And therefore, it might, might be unwise to either reduce scroll speed or use something that uh, doesn't handle um, very fast scroll speed. Or maybe you need to build something in mind to navigate through a huge list of items. Um, a phone book comes to mind with being able to uh, navigate to a specific letter of an alphabet in order to um, get through tens of thousands of items. Uh, that's typically handed on Android by a recycler view, but um, so you don't have to think about it, but it's important to keep in mind when you're approaching it from a beginner standpoint. Uh, next thing is pixel density. We don't really think about this because our devices are super, super high resolution these days, but if you were to take uh, um, a microscope and look at your phone's display, you might see something like this on some of your uh, UI elements. And that's because uh, pixels are squares at the end of the day. They're, they're squares that made, are made up of light um, that is a combination of RGB or um, OLED screens operate differently. And I am not a hardware engineer at all, so I can't explain any of that. But um, uh, different uh, different devices with different resolutions support um, higher density pixels, and that's how we get smoother shapes. So if you were to use uh, vector graphics instead of um, bitmaps, you might have smoother outcomes, um, especially if you're trying to scale stuff. So now let's build some apps. Um, first, we're going to look at a calculator. And uh, as I mentioned before, I have to keep configuration changes in mind. And this particular calculator app does completely reorient its entire layout. And as you can see, it's more accessible to the user um, in this state than it was uh, before it refreshed. Like all the buttons are now in the bottom row, and uh, and it input was at the top, and then. Again, when you reorient the app, uh, the layout refreshes and the buttons are again at the bottom accessible to the user's thumbs for inputting numbers and calculations. So if we were to try to um, write some code for how this would operate, and this, I'm going to do this at a super high level so you don't have to know code in order to um, make this yourself. or uh, uh, in, in, you don't have to know code in order to follow along. I'm going to explain everything. We're going to have two operators that are floats and an operand that I'm going to say that's an operand type, and it's going to be able to take in different things like plus, minus, et cetera. And what I want to be able to do is if I tap one or any of the numbers as inputs, that it gets stored as the first operator. And if I tap um, a operand button after having typed an operator, that that gets registered as the current operand in memory. And if I type another number input, a number, another one, um, that gets stored as the operator B. And if I hit equals, I should get a calculated result. Uh, next. Uh, let's think about how a flashlight would work, or a flashlight app. And we've seen thousands of these in the Play Store, and they're filled with ads, and that's really sad. But um, this one's not going to have any ads because we're not writing a whole lot of code here. So let's let's pretend that this uh, comment line uh, toggles camera flash, and uh, that's all this app does. It, we had non-create, we had a layout with a button, and we somehow implemented to toggle camera flash. But the UI didn't update. So we actually have to go back and make sure that we update 
uh, write some code to update the button appearance so that when we do run this and, and actually hit that button, that it does toggle. Um, this gives the user not just uh, the feedback via the flash that something worked, but something visual. Um, this is important to keep in mind that uh, the more feedback and more different ways of giving you feedback that you have, the more uh, confident a user is that your app is operating as expected. If you have a button where a user can click something and uh, load something and it works really fast for you because your API calls are, are, are six milliseconds or hundred milliseconds or less because you live in the United States, well, doesn't it's not the same experience as someone halfway around the world who waits a second every single time they tap a button to load something or submit something. And if there is not some visual or other indicator that something's happening, they're going to think your app is broken. Uh, so another way to make this uh, is to give feedback is not just visual, but also audio. Um, and through a more uh, nice looking animation. We just made the same exact app, but just by thinking about it a little bit more, uh, we can see that there's more feedback, it's more satisfying, it looks like a nicer app. Uh, last version of this is a, a lantern flashlight app where if the user swipes up from the bottom, not only does the flash turn on and the screen start to illuminate, but it illuminates as much as the user swipes uh, to the point where when they swipe up all the way to the top of the screen, um, you get the entire app illuminated. This also looks really great. And if there was a nice like fire crackly sound, um, that would be great too. So we looked at some one sensor, but what other sensors are there? Uh, quite a few, uh, motion connectivity, environment, audio, video, it's all sorts of things that you can use to build an app. Um, we looked at the camera sensor for a flashlight. Um, this is what I use at my job. Uh, and we only use what we need. Uh, it's important to keep that in mind that you don't need a rotation vector or step counter um, if you're not going to use them. Uh, there's no point to ask for it. Um, one of those per uh, permissions or sensors was uh, internet. And what can you do with the internet besides just sending ones and zeros all over it? Well, you can connect to all these people that I mentioned before, and you can connect them to each other, um, no matter where they are in the world, on this side or uh, on the other side, where probably some of uh, the speakers here started this morning. So uh, now taking all that and trying to put it together, um, and, and also what can I really, what kind of app could I make with um, internet connectivity. Well, I'm going to make an Edgar app and Edgar is my dog and he's really lovable. So I'm going to make an app that shows photos of him and people can download this app and see them from anywhere, anywhere in the world. And they can tap on one of these photos and see Edgar even more because he's so lovable and he's such a good puppy. Um, Next is, uh, how would I distribute an app? Uh, and the thing about distributing apps is you need to upload them to some place for some people to download. Um, typically, most and, uh, Android and iOS developers upload them to the Apple App Store and, and Google Play. Um, you can also upload them to other places, uh, other stores, uh, Samsung and uh, Hawaii uh, have their own app stores. Uh, there's uh, open source Android um, centers for apps like F Android, I believe. And the, the mechanics of how apps are signed and how they're downloaded are all very similar on all of these. You can automate your app to be published to all of them. That is a lot of work and not every single user on the world is in every single store. Most of them are in these two. So uh, most people I know upload to these. Uh, 
if you do upload or distribute your app through either of these stores, you have to keep in mind a set of guidelines uh, that they put out. Uh, these guidelines are not really negotiable and you have to follow them. Uh, permissions, and this is something to uh, keep in mind about permissions, is we are asking uh, users to be allowed to run something on their device and use a particular action or sensor on it to do something of value for them. Uh, we are not using these permissions uh, just because we can or just because uh, we can get away with it. Um, permissions are something that you have to keep in mind as you're asking every single person every time that they run their app for permission to do this. Um, if you don't approach it that way and instead say, ah, I want to collect metrics because marketing told me to, um, you're going to end up with really unhappy users that uh, discover what you're doing and stop using your app or report you and it's probably illegal or will be someday. Uh, there's also ethics and responsibility that goes into this. Uh, not just the permissions, but everything. At the end of the day, you are running something on someone's very personal device. It's in their pocket. They take it with them all the time. 10 years ago, this was kind of unimaginable that a programmer would have this much access to someone's personal life to travel around with them all the time. And whenever we make anything, we have to keep that in mind that uh, we have been allowed into people's lives. Um, we are not necessarily welcome by default. It's something that we've uh, earned and something that can go away uh, by people choosing to not use it anymore. So. If you're interested in Android development, um, you can definitely get started here, developer.android.com. And uh, also uh, Android Dev Summit, um, that photo uh, behind is a great place to visit and learn. I, I hear they're putting on a, a, um, a show soon. So, um, And that's about all I have. Uh, any questions? Um, looking at the Q and A tab now. All right. I guess they're all me right now. That's cool. Um, useful resources for finding junior role job postings. Um, this is really hard, especially right now. I was just helping a friend try to find an entry level or junior level position because uh, he his graduated boot camp doesn't have a CS degree and it's hard. Um, I would say reach out to people in every single venue that you can. Um, one tip, uh, I got told from my friend was, um, Hey, go on LinkedIn and try to take the Android test and get that Android badge on your profile. Recruiters notice it. Um, it's not honestly that useful for like senior level development, but someone just starting out, um, getting recruiters asking you for a job instead of you having to go and pursue en um, entry level roles. Um, uh, that's a decent step. Um, make sure <laughs> make sure to keep practicing. Uh, try, try to do something like 100 days of code where you um, start a repository or um, uh, start creating an app that is super simple and I, I don't care how ugly it looks. Um, after a couple of days or a week, put it on the Play Store. Um, you might get one star reviews, but the act of um, trying to self-publish and get good at publishing uh, and repeatedly publish, that's practice for how it's going to be like working on a team. Uh, another thing you can do is just reach out to people on Twitter, look in Twitter spaces and um, or, or, or any social network really, and just ask people for advice on how to look or where to look. Um, there are a lot of people out there that will answer those questions and those calls for help with helpful resources and pointers, um, and job boards. Um, 
Uh, and lastly, I, I did just notice um, old places uh, that um, I saw a willow tree has a junior level opening. Um, and it says it's not remote, but it actually is. And I, s I saw Dropbox had a junior software opening, but it just closed, I think. Um, so keep looking there and, and other places. Uh, uh, next question. Uh, I, I hope that was enough. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, what's your advice for getting out, to, out of tutorial hell? Cool. So. Um, once you're once you've done code labs or and tutorials and you're like oh, i'm tired of this uh, i just want to make a real thing make my own thing or uh, pub uh, publish something on google play that's not a flashlight app um take that tutorial and add something uh, uh take something you've made from that tutorial and add something different to it um uh, make it your own instead of um following a tutorial to just display a list of the 170-ish countries around the world. Um, make it display, I don't know, um, uh, your local government um, uh, Zoom meeting resources. Um, make something for your city or town that's like how to explore what's going on. Um, if you're a parent, make an app that's a to-do list for tracking um, how big your kid is or um, how much they've uh, progressed in uh, learning something. Um, maybe make an app that helps you keep track of your budget. Um, uh, do, do things that are useful. Um, uh, if you, if you, um, I will share my slides later, um, but if you look back at the motivation one, like for like, th that is how you get out of um, tutorial hell and like you, you find useful things around you to build. Um, is Hinge looking for any entry level engineers? We just hired one, unfortunately. So that's currently not open. I'm really sorry. Um, we will have future openings, but entry level, not right now. Um, and uh, what can a new Android engineer do to, oh, sorry. I, I, I've been like reading the questions on the side and, and I didn't realize you were picking the question that I'm answering. Okay. Um, what can a new Android engineer do to nail an Android specific interview? Um, I highly recommend reaching out to uh, the engineers and hiring manager and ask them what their interview process is. And if they're vague at all, ask them for more details because you want to succeed in their interview. Uh, and if, and you should get to a point where they either say, uh, we do leak code or we do a pair programming interview, or our skills interviews look at these types of skills, and we want to uh, see that you know Android knowledge and how, how to uh, talk through using a recycler view or make network requests or um, how to problem solve a product spec. Um, uh, you, you should be able to ask them for details on their interview and they should be willing to share them to a point. Um, they're probably not going to give away the entire script or the matrix of how they grade. Um, but the um, whenever I've asked, I've gotten decent answers. And if, and if you're not getting decent answers, either apply to other places or ask on Twitter. And I'm sure you'll get like 100 different replies of, hey, this is what our interview process is. Um, like, um, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll link to that later. <laughs> um, uh, next question. Um, CS degree. No. Um, I have one, and I think it's valuable to me. But I have met some of the best and brightest software developers I know, and they don't have CS degrees. I have also met people who have CS degrees that are also really brilliant and smart. And what a CS degree gives you is computer science foundations. If you're going to go really far in um, as a software engineer, um, 
software engineering or app development is not computer science. It's not. Um, computer science is the, the study of how computers execute programs. It's the study of how to design algorithms and how to prove them to be correct. It's design, design of databases and how to build them or how to design tables for them. Some of that overlaps with software development and app development, but quite a lot of app development is what I just presented. It's thinking about how users are going to use it. It's thinking about how uh, data is going to flow through it. It's thinking about how people are going to interact with it. It's thinking about um, how is this all going to work together and is the user going to understand how to use this thing? So um, it, it helps, but and by no means is it required at a lot of jobs. And um, yeah. Uh, next question. Is it relevant to get the associate Android developer cert by Google to get a job? Um, if you don't have a CS degree, some kind of cert or like going through an online course or boot camp um, does help. It, if you already have a CS degree or if you already have a job, um, whether or not that's a job in mobile, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to go get this cert. Um, I, I know people who have it or who have gone on to be GDEs and they're right. And I think it does help them uh, in their job searches when they do, do go look for a job. I, I, I've noticed that um, uh, uh, we actually uh, um, just hired someone uh, who has a GDE, um, but, or is a GDE, but I don't think that that is, um, it is relevant but it's not necessary. Uh, next. Um, I am doing Android and iOS in the company. However, I'm not sure I could do successfully both. Do you think it is okay? Um, so it sounds like you you are doing both, but you're not sure you are able to handle doing both or you're not sure if you can successfully do both. Um, I think um, I've thought about learning iOS because uh, I think it's interesting um, and also just like heck of a lot easier to support 30 devices instead of 10,000. Um, but you can only do one thing at a time. Uh, no human being can like multiply the number of hands that they have. You can only type on one keyboard in one language at one point. So if you do go and learn iOS development as well as Android, um, that's great. It probably makes you versatile for certain projects, uh, especially consulting projects, I think. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that you can only do one thing at a time, which means you can only be doing excellent at one thing at one time you can uh, per perhaps eventually with a lot of time and patience and practice get really good at both, but it's going to take you longer than if you focused on one. Um, um, I, 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 it, it depends. Um, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that to, for a vague answer on that. Um, any other questions? Do you think Kotlin education is sufficiently beginner friendly? Um, yeah, I really do. Um, Kotlin is definitely my favorite language. Um, I think it's like a close, very close second to Python in terms of beginner level for beginner level friendliness. Um, and maybe a couple other languages are similarly uh, as simple as Python as writing hello world, because it's literally one line where you say like, hello world, that's it. Um, but I think Kotlin specifically, not just uh, Android Kotlin, um, Kotlin is a really welcoming language. It is different from Scala, where there were all these weird operators to do things and you could do things in iterative or functional programming, but 
it felt like this fight that was going on um, of what way to write it. And every time I looked in Scala code, there was, it always looked different. Whereas when I look in Kotlin code, it usually looks the same. Uh, not everyone uses KT Lint or, or a similar formatter, but I find Kotlin fairly easy to read and to write. Um, I just, uh, I want, uh, one of my coworkers pointed out, I wrote a million lines of Kotlin um, since, this, since I've started in 2016, so that's cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, any other questions? Uh, well, if there are, we could also, uh, you know, everybody can, uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break uh, before the final talk by Will. Um, and if anybody has additional questions left over, definitely uh, feel free to reach out, like to just join a table and chat with Jason. If Jason, you have time to hang out. Yeah, yeah. I got time to hang out. Uh, that one question, uh, no, it was not. Hinge was not founded by software dev devs. It was founded by someone who uh, got broken up with, and um, he uh, uh, eventually did uh, this crazy thing where he flew to Europe to um, stop her from getting married to somebody else. And uh, she said uh, yes and flew back with him. That was a very short story uh, version. Super romantic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Then we'll end this session. And Jason, again, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Honestly, it might have been one of the best uh, intro to Android development um, sessions I, I've seen in a very long time. Um, I, I wish I had seen it when I was getting started. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> happy to. And uh, yeah, I'll stick around for a bit. So I'll see you guys in the rooms. All right. And that's, uh, yeah. Thank you.